On March 23, 2021, Intel's new CEO, Pat Gelsinger, stands in a studio. The camera crew bustles around him as he prepares to address the company and share his strategy, a plan to save Intel. The tech giant had once ruled the industry, yet recently they had been beaten down time and time again. Morale within the company was at rock bottom and investors were losing patience as the stock had been going sideways for over 20 years. Intel needed a savior and the board believed they'd found one. The cameras begin rolling and everyone watches eagerly. The new CEO unveils his strategy. Great companies are able to come back from periods of challenge and come back stronger and more capable than ever. IDM 2.0 is an elegant strategy that only Intel can deliver, and it's a winning formula. This was Intel's moment. Employees, investors, and the board had total faith in Gelsinger. They were going to take back the industry and rise to the top once again. Yet, that's not how it played out. Less than four years later, Intel is in flames. Gelsinger's perfect strategy has backfired. Costs are being cut, the stock price is plummeting, and Gelsinger has been forced out. This is the story of how Intel destroyed itself. First, we need some context. Intel has been falling behind their competitors for decades. Despite creating the world's first commercial microprocessor chip, the Intel 4004, along with a long, long list of breakthroughs. They completely ignored the boom of smartphones, and even when Steve Jobs offered them the chance to make chips for the iPhone, they declined. According to them, the margins were too small. But that's not all. They also totally underestimated GPUs, thinking they were a niche product for gaming and instead focused on CPUs. Needless to say, with crypto mining and aspically AI, they were very, very wrong. They also completely underestimated AMD's comeback with Ryzen. So why the lack of foresight? Well, Intel slowly became complacent. They were such an integral part of PCs with their deal with Microsoft Windows, aka Wintel. They made billions from this, but this also made them blindsided when PC sales began to slow in the 2000s 10s. To call Intel a slow mover would be an understatement. They needed a radical change. They needed a bold new strategy. They needed Pat Gelsinger. In early 2021, the board appointed Gelsinger as CEO, and there was reason to be confident. Many giant companies fall into the trap of appointing someone with accounting or general business experience into the role of CEO. Intel themselves had done this for most of the 2000s, but Gelsinger was different. He had been an engineer at Intel for 30 years and even led VMware as CEO. He was the lead architect on the 486, Intel's first x86 chip, which is still a huge part of computers today. It wasn't just the board either. Intel's staff were ecstatic. Even those inevitably laid off by Gelsinger believed he was the right person for the job. So what was his plan? As he addressed the company, he communicated his strategy to put Intel back on top. We are setting a course for a new era of innovation and product leadership at Intel. We will use IDM 2.0 to design the best products and manufacture them in the best way possible for every category we compete in. But what was IDM 2.0 and how was it going to save Intel? Well, Gelsinger was betting big on something called foundries. These are massive manufacturing plants where microchips are manufactured. Chip makers like Nvidia or AMD design their own microchips, but they outsource the production. Intel, however, designs and produces their own chips and now was going to massively expand this production. Why? Well, when you look at the benefits, it makes a lot of sense. With Intel falling behind, they needed a huge way to catch up, specifically to TSMC. TSMC is a gigantic chip producer based in Taiwan, which holds over 50% of the global foundry market. In fact, they just recently crossed a $1 trillion market cap, but TSMC was unique. They didn't design their own chips, they only produced for others, like NVIDIA or Apple. There were very few options for foundries, and everyone relied on TSMC in some capacity. They made the most advanced chips, yet Intel, who only made their own, were falling far behind. Intel needed to catch up. They already had their own foundries, which exclusively produced their own chips. But with this investment, they were going to produce chips for everyone else as well. External customers meant more money. Gelsinger said, IDM 2.0 is an elegant strategy that only Intel can deliver, and it's a winning formula. Intel was in a unique position, being the only chip manufacturer in the United States and that the US government saw this as the way to defend American chip superiority. 
With the CHIPS Act soon to be passed, Intel alone would have access to billions in funding and subsidies. The stars were aligning, and Gelsinger was optimistic. Intel has its best days in front of us, he said. Yet it wasn't a small bet. Intel needed to invest over $20 billion to enact IDM 2.0, and there'd be many more costs after that, adding up to a total of $100 billion. But this could put them back in the game. Intel had become too reliant on consumer desktop CPUs, leaving its revenue tied to market conditions. Even a small ripple in demand could cascade into a tidal wave, shaking the entire company. They needed to diversify. IDM 2.0 was Intel's lifeboat. Investors were confident, and after Gelsinger took the reins, Intel's share price jumped to $64, the highest in two decades. Everything was going great. Intel were set up to take on the world. Yet, before things even began, the cracks began to show. The plan was excellent, but Intel still had a massive problem. One of the most important factors of a semiconductor is its processor size. The smaller the processor, the more transistors can fit on a microchip. More transistors means faster speed and less power used. In the 2000s tens, Intel announced a massive breakthrough. Their chips were going to have 10 nanometers process nodes, and they were going to be ready in 2016. Extremely impressive, but there was a problem. A few years went by, and these semiconductors were nowhere to be seen. There was delay after delay. Despite Intel's aggressive plans, they hadn't laid the groundwork, and were trying to shrink the semiconductors with the same old technology. Their revolutionary 10 nanometer chips would eventually be pushed back to 2019. This would have been impressive in 2016, but keep in mind, Intel isn't the only one making semiconductors. By 2019, this breakthrough was already out of date, but it gets even worse. Heaps of the chips they were producing at 10 nanometers were defective, so they had to push back to next innovation. Seven nanometer chips from 2021 to 2023, or even later. But why couldn't Intel keep up? What was causing all these delays? Well, other foundries had adopted a new technology, extreme ultraviolet lithography, or EUV. Intel, however, had tried to innovate without it. They were extremely aggressive and optimistic, yet hadn't laid the foundation to support this leap forward. In 2021, as Intel began IDM 2.0 and building the new foundries, it was still simultaneously fixing their massive failure, still trying to deliver these 10 nanometer and seven nanometer semiconductors. Things get even worse, however, when we look at TSMC. Since they were producing semiconductors for all kinds of clients, they were far more experienced than Intel, who only manufactured their own chips. Not only that, TSMC has adopted EUV technology early, along with Samsung. By this point, TSMC was producing chips with 7 nanometers, 5 nanometers, and even 3 nanometers. As Intel built its foundries, spending over $20 billion, they were eager to capture some of TSMC's market share. But they began to notice something. Despite all the hype and excitement, the demand wasn't nearly as high as they thought. In fact, they were struggling to capture new customers. But the explanation is pretty simple. Intel was falling further behind, and it was apparent to everyone. Other tech giants just didn't trust them, especially compared to TSMC. Intel was aggressive, but they got too far ahead of themselves. Now they were playing catch up, and it was impacting their new IDM strategy. At a time when manufacturing was getting harder and harder, we set a more and more aggressive goal, said Intel's past CEO, Robert Swan. We prioritized performance at a time when predictability was really important. Intel's new investment was off to a troubling start, but things were about to get much worse. Intel differed significantly from TSMC in a very important area. Though it was more than just their chips of manufacturing, it was something at the heart of each company. TSMC spent a huge amount of time and effort with their customers. They had a reputation for this, decades of it. TSMC's foundry was dedicated to external parties, so keeping customer trust is their top priority. They even say so on their website. With Intel, however, it's much more complicated. They struggled to build trust with other giants like Apple or Nvidia. Part of it came from a conflict of interest. Intel manufactured chips, but it also designed them. Naturally, they would prioritize their own chips over external partners, who, despite manufacturing for them, were actually competitors. As such, companies like NVIDIA didn't exactly trust them, so getting their business was unbelievably difficult. Other companies like Apple had abandoned Intel altogether in a dramatic fashion. 
the two companies used to have a strong partnership. But in 2020, Apple announced it would start using its own custom silicon for its Mac products. Apple Silicon will make the Mac stronger and more capable than ever, said Tim Cook. Yet behind the scenes, this was really a breakup. A former Intel engineer revealed that the quality assurance of Skylake, one of Intel's general processors, was more than a problem. It was abnormally bad. We were getting way too much sighting for little things inside Skylake. Basically, our buddies at Apple became the number one filer of problems in the architecture. And that went really, really bad. When your customer starts finding almost as many bugs as you found yourself, you're not leading into the right place. Apple was becoming more and more frustrated with missed deadlines and issues and decided enough was enough. I mean, just think about it. Why wouldn't you use the company making better products with more advanced technology, with no conflict of interest, with better customer service? At that point, marginal price differences are irrelevant. The answer in this industry is not price, but customer service. To make matters worse, the trend Intel banked on had played out its natural and unfortunate course. The 2020 surge in semiconductors was slowing down and had now hit a slump. What everyone wanted now was GPUs, not CPUs. So not only was Intel fighting to win back customers, but the industry itself and the trend they banked on was failing them. By this point, Intel had poured billions into foundries. They set out to build $20 billion in Arizona, but also needed to invest to upgrade their existing plants. $3.5 billion in New Mexico, $3 billion in Oregon, $3.5 billion in Costa Rica, $7 billion in Ireland, and over $10 billion in Israel. It's estimated Intel had spent over $100 billion in its new strategy, a strategy that wasn't pulling in revenue nearly as fast as it hoped. There were some big contracts, even from NVIDIA, but by this point, it was years into the strategy. To solve this problem, Intel had to take drastic action. In 2024, with a lack of customer trust and revenue, they created an independent subsidiary for its foundry business. The idea was to completely remove bias and the conflict of interest from manufacturing. Then came the cost cutting. Intel announced $10 billion cost cutting. 15% of staff would be removed. 15,000 jobs would be lost. Despite this move of good faith and a contract to produce chips for Amazon's AWS, it was too little, too late. By the end of 2024, their share price had fallen to just over $20. The entire company had turned unprofitable, and staff morale had fallen once again. Enough was enough. In December 2024, Intel announced the abrupt and sudden retirement of Pat Gelsinger. Most suspected, however, that the board had fired him. It was so sudden that the board didn't even have a successor in mind yet. They just knew it was time for Gelsinger to go, and Gelsinger troubles weren't over just yet. Intel is now suing him and seeking to reclaim the $207 million he earned as a salary. They claimed that he hid the mismanagement and failure of his foundry strategy from investors. And it really seems that the foundry strategy was doomed from the start. They had made mistakes prior, and they were trying to spend their way out of a core issue instead of tackling the foundation. In the early days of Gelsinger's plan, critics believed that 11th hour spending spree won't rectify its years of manufacturing mistakes. And they were right. Intel might be able to turn this strategy around, but based on their track record and entrenched mindset, I'm not so optimistic. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell so you don't miss out on more incredible stories like this one.